In May 2023, Marvel Comics killed off Miss Marvel. I wouldn't call that a spoiler given the story's title and the fact that Marvel announced her death weeks before it actually happened, like it was kind of hard to miss at the time. This was supposed to be a big event. You've got Spider-Man bawling his eyes out on the front cover, you've got her parents, her friends, her superhero allies, all grieving and reflecting on the impact she'd had on their lives. Truly, the Marvel Universe would never be the same. And uh, then she came back, less than two months later. Alright, she's in the X-Men now, I guess that's kinda cool. Now this happens all the time in comics, especially with the X-Men. It gets to the point where even the characters themselves are aware of it. So when Professor X dies for the twelfth time, they're like, uh, is he really dead though? Like he kinda does that a lot. Oh wait no, he's back now, okay, we're all good. When Marvel launched their Ultimate Universe in the early 2000s, it was kinda the solution to this problem. A brand new continuity where they could try out a bunch of new things. Some good, some maybe not so good, but it was new, it was fresh, and the stakes were high. If one of the X-Men died in the Ultimate Universe, chances were they weren't coming back. As the years went on, Ultimate Marvel dropped the ball. They slipped into old habits, they retconned deaths that had taken place earlier in the series. This new and exciting universe was no longer new, and kind of getting a bit stale. Okay, said Marvel, we need to get people back on board, we need to raise the stakes again. This time we're going to kill one of the characters and we're going to make sure they stay dead. In fact, no, what if we kill a bunch of them at once? A Game of Thrones type thing to really raise the stakes, proving that anyone can die anytime and not even your favourite character is safe. In fact, no, what if we take a whole bunch of the X-Men, Wolverine, Professor X, Cyclops, Nightcrawler, Beast, characters that have been associated with the X-Men brand for decades and just kill them off. Half of them can die off screen, like I don't even care at this point. Alright, so what are we going to do after that? What? Like once we killed off all the X-Men, what happens to Ultimate X-Men? Do we cancel the series? Ah no, see that's the thing. We'll just keep going. We'll continue Ultimate X-Men with like two of the X-Men. Are you fucking serious? And so Marvel did exactly this. They released the big crossover, Ultimatum, which saw the X-Men villain Magneto finally getting his revenge on humanity. He didn't do the classic villain thing where he just explains his plan, you know, he gives the heroes time to stop him. No, he just did it. Millions gone in the blink of an eye. Characters were cut out of the story like flowers in a garden. No prolonged, overly dramatic death, no conclusion to their character arc. Just snip, 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 and they were gone. Often in the most brutal of ways. They've got a big list at the end of the crossover, listing the many, many characters who died. But some of these characters weren't even mentioned to have died throughout the entire storyline. I think they just wanted to add people to the list. Sorry, Toad fans, I guess he's dead now. I don't know what response Marvel was hoping for, but critical reception was not exactly the best. The story is frequently featured on the worst comics of all time lists, and is widely known to have killed the Ultimate Universe as a whole. Reviewer Zach Edwards described it as the reading equivalent of snorting concentrated floor cleaner and feeling your brain cells slowly and painfully die. Now the Marvel creative team could have chickened out at this point, but they didn't. Even though the goal with these next volumes was to return hope to the series, to redeem themselves from the absolute disaster they just released, they didn't just pretend Ultimatum never happened. They didn't poke fun at it or say it was all a dream. Instead, they took it extremely seriously. They committed to everything that had happened and said, okay, how do we reflect on this? How do we use the failure of this event to advantage. Either this was the plan all along, or maybe there was a bit of course correction in there. Regardless, I think what comes next is really interesting. In the post-Ultimatum world, you do not get to be a mutant in America anymore. The few surviving members of the X-Men, these kids essentially, are hunted down, blamed for Magneto's attack. While before they operated from a warm, cosy mansion, they're now forced into the cold, dark sewers, completely overwhelmed, grieving, and trying to carry on an impossible legacy left by their dead friends. As a whole, I think it's a really effective story, made all the more satisfying by the fact that you know these changes are permanent. These characters can't rely on the status quo. Their dead friends aren't coming back. Instead, they've got to work with what they've got and build something new out of it. Now, some people would disagree with what I've just said. They'd argue that Ultimatum wasn't the thing that ruined the series. Instead, the series was completely flawed from the beginning and wasn't worth reading in the first place. And looking back, uh, yeah, I can see why you'd say that. When Ultimate first came out, it was almost embarrassed of the comics that came before it. It was the 2000s, everyone was trying to be edgy, there's a bunch of dialogue in there that was meant to sound really cool at the time, but is now just difficult to take seriously. Despite this, there are some pieces of absolute gold in there. For example, you've got the Brotherhood of Mutants, right? This is nothing new, they've been around since the 60s. But in the Ultimate Universe, their evil plan is to catfish the X-Men on AOL chat rooms. You've got Beast sitting there, kicking his feet, talking to who he thinks is a mutant girl his own age, being all like, oh, I love you, when can I meet you? Meanwhile, the Blobs on the other end, being like, I've got this idiot in the palm of my fucking hand right now. And then he somehow convinces Beast to give up, like, ultra classified information, like how Magneto's still alive. Genuinely one of the most successful evil plans to date. 
And speaking of Magneto, because he's going to be really important in a second, the ultimate version of him isn't nearly as nuanced as his mainstream counterpart, and also I think this one might be a cannibal? At least I hope that's only a figure of speech. Magneto, or Eric, sees mutants as above humans. Just like how humans took over from apes, it's now time for mutants to do the same. He might just have to speed up the process. Now given the trauma he's endured, and all the hate towards mutants he's seen his whole life, you can kind of see why he thinks that. He simply doesn't have the energy to give humans the benefit of the doubt. Compassion, he thinks, is a privilege for those who haven't suffered their whole life, who haven't had to fight for who they are. And so he's like, whatever, I'm gonna drop a nuke on them. There's a really nice moment early on in the run between Charles and Eric. Now for context, the X-Men have recently defeated one of Eric's evil plans and also faked his death. In an attempt to rehabilitate Eric, Charles has blocked off all of his memories and is now letting him live a normal life free of pain and the desire for nuclear extinction. Shortly after, things go wrong. Not with Eric, no, he's having a gay old time catching frisbees. But Charles, he goes through hell. Now Charles is the Miyazaki of the Ultimate Universe, in that he was so wrapped up in his brilliant work that he kind of forgot he had a son. David Xavier, also a mutant, blames his dad for neglecting him all of these years, and goes on a rampage. He kills hundreds of people, tearing down his dad's legacy in a matter of minutes. Charles has worked for years as the poster child of the non-violent mutant rights movement, and now his name will forever be associated with this massive loss of life. However, before David can go any further, he is killed by Colossus, who triumphantly crushes him to death with a car. The other X-Men congratulate Colossus, the day is saved, go team. Now of course, what Colossus did was necessary. If he hadn't stepped in, more lives would have been lost. Not to mention how satisfying it is to see this murderous asshole get a taste of his own medicine. But what sucks is that by doing so, Colossus, and by association the rest of the X-Men, have brought themselves down to David's level. They're kind of giving him what he wanted. The entire discourse surrounding mutants, years of negotiation and compromise have all been reduced into this one act of violence, and the entire world was watching. The world wants mutants to kill each other. Yes, it makes people scared and oh my god, the mutants are taking over, but it also gives them a whole bunch of pride, it lets them justify their hate, it lets them say, yes, I told you so. Violence is not how they're gonna solve things. But right now, it seems like the only solution, and that's enough to make Charles question everything. Is his principle of non-violence truly doomed to fail? Is Eric right about him? Is he only holding on to these values because he wants to appear morally superior to everyone else? And all of this self-doubt is enough for him to be like, nope, that's it, I'm shutting down the X-Men, the school, everything. We will never understand each other, I can't help anyone, I'm gonna go sit in the shower and cry, while my X-Men risk their lives for nothing. Also, his son is dead, like I guess that's a big part of it. What's funny is that the person who gets him out of this state isn't one of his students or his superhero allies. Ironically, Eric is the one who makes him hope again. With Charles so wrapped up in cynicism, he really just needs an act of kindness, a reminder that his values are worth fighting for, and Eric, having lost his memory, gives him just that. Before Eric's interference, Charles was going down a dangerous path. Dangerous not only to himself, but to the world. By devaluing himself and his expertise, and being all like, oh, who am I to impose my beliefs on anyone? He was almost willing to free a man who wants to kill everyone. He was valuing these other viewpoints in the name of humility, which helps no one when some of these other viewpoints involve nuclear missiles. What Eric does, albeit under extreme brainwashing, is make Charles believe in his own voice, remind him how valuable his expertise is, and make him be like, actually no, I do know what I'm talking about. Some harmful ideas aren't worth the benefit of the doubt. I should actually take a fucking stand and do what I believe in and open back up the X-Men and keep spying on my underage students. This moment injects some much needed hope into the series going forward, and like Charles, we begin to notice the good in people again. Sure, on one hand you have Wolverine. He's creepy, he tries to kill Cyclops all because he wants to get with Jean. He does that thing in the bushes, some of you will know what I'm talking about. But on the other hand, you have someone like Kitty, who is compassionate, she's eager, she's able to tease people without aggravating them. Or you have Bobby, who yes, has his flaws, he's quite rash, he can get agitated easily, but underneath he has a heart of gold. When his friends are in danger, he'll put himself in harm's way without even thinking about it. When offered 100 million dollars to make a public statement condemning Charles in his school, which honestly, not a bad shout, given that Charles manipulated him into joining the team and is also just a weirdo around his students, but no, Bobby refuses. Once again, thinking of his friends and what this is going to do to them, he tears up the statement, going against the will of his family, politicians, and the world, on national television. Whenever the series starts to lose my interest, it's these guys who make me stick with it. Kitty, Bobby, Rogue, this newer, more optimistic generation. In a world of angst and edginess and tragedy, it's so refreshing when you get a scene of them just hanging out and having fun. By the time we get to the 100 issue mark, Charles has died only to be revealed that, surprise surprise, he's still alive, and then in Ultimatum he gets killed by Eric anyway. 
Now, the reason Charles dies so much in X-Men media is one, because that shit's gonna look good on the cover, but also him leaving the series and passing on the responsibility to his students is a big part of X-Men. Despite his immense brain power, Charles is not the guy he's gonna solve everything. He'd sure like to be, but no, it's ridiculous to think that this one man is gonna have all the answers to the future where mutants and humans live in harmony. You see, Charles, for all his problems, got pretty damn lucky. Mutants' powers are a lottery. You could become a social freak, your powers could kill everyone you love, and yet Charles got an incredibly overpowered ability which not only let him read people's minds, but he could also pass as a regular human. His job isn't to fix the future, but to use his privilege to provide for less fortunate mutants, to give them a controlled environment to fail in, the training to defend themselves physically, and the vocabulary to defend themselves verbally so that they aren't just reduced to a threat or a joke by the media. And so when he gets shot in the head, or killed by the Phoenix Force, or when the alien brood lay eggs in his brain, okay that one doesn't really count, but he still lives on in his teachings to his students. They are the ones who will go out and build that brighter future. Now Ultimatum is a perfect opportunity to demonstrate this, right? Magneto says enough is enough, I want to get revenge for my weird incest kids and so he attacks. He wipes out New York and snaps Charles' neck in the process. The remaining X-Men find him, it's completely devastating, but now they'll have to prove what they've learned with how they respond to this. The whole series has been leading to this. It's a return to the conflict in Act 1 with David and Colossus, but on a much grander scale. The stakes have never been higher and it's time to provide the solution that they weren't equipped to deliver previously. Time to prove that they learned something in those 80-something issues since, and whatever they do will find the overall message of the story. Okay, so they're pissed off, that's understandable. Jean's out for blood, Cyclops is out for blood, Wolverine, I mean that's no real surprise, but there's this constant mention of killing and whether it's the only solution, and it's building up for a big decision at the end about whether to actually kill Magneto. To prove him right, to prove David right, to prove the world right. Okay, they're going after Magneto. Angel is killed in the process, hope you weren't a fan of him, but still, his sacrifice wasn't in vain, they keep going, they manage to confront Magneto. Just then, Magneto rips the metal off of Wolverine's skeleton, damaging him beyond the point of being able to heal. Still, his sacrifice wasn't in vain, as it's left Magneto severely injured, giving the other heroes the upper hand. This is it, this is the moment which will define the series. And it's so frustrating because Eric is giving them an out here. He's bringing up Charles, he's reminding them of what he stood for. Hey, remember one of the core themes of the series, guys? But Cyclops says no, Charles is gone. And when he died, his philosophy died with him. He did not pass on his values, we learn nothing, and then he proceeds to laser his face off. The end. To be clear, I'm not saying that, ah, by killing Magneto, Cyclops is just as bad, if not worse than him. No, you can see why Cyclops wouldn't be up for pacifism when he's just seen his whole family get squad wiped. The real problem is more the fact that the series had been building to this moral situation for years, only for Cyclops to deliver a rather depressing solution which spits in the face of the man he's trying to avenge, and he's never given an opportunity to reflect on his actions or even acknowledge it at all because the series ends two seconds later. I want to draw your attention to a moment way earlier in the series, just to highlight how fucked this ending is. In issue 41, a kid wakes up to find his parents, his classmates, all sorts of people around him, dead, completely vaporised. He, unfortunately, lost the mutant lottery, for his power is that he just kills things around him. His life as a mutant is over before he even gets to begin. Wolverine tracks the kid down, which leads to one of my favourite moments from the series. As Logan explains the situation, the kid completely breaks down, reflecting on the hundreds of people he killed, reflecting on all the things he never did, and how cruelly random nature can be. It's a really raw and powerful and depressing as fuck moment. It's one of the rare cases where the X-Men can't promise everything's gonna be okay and give him a better life. Logan's mission is not to take this kid in, but to take him out. The public cannot find out that it was a mutant who caused all this death. Otherwise mutants would be done, they'd be put into camps. The only shred of solace this kid gets before he dies is that his death will prevent others like him from being hunted down. It may be over for him, but at the very least he's dying for the bigger picture. Not only is this scene really haunting, given that this nightmare scenario does come true in the end, but I think it highlights just how much was on the line and how much went to waste with Ultimatum. This event, which concluded this entire era, basically said that all of this suffering, all of the struggles of the last hundred issues, were for nothing. This kid died for nothing, Charles' efforts were all for nothing, and honestly, that could work if it was handled differently. It could have been a tragic yet powerful tale showing how trauma can blind you from a better future, a grim warning to the readers not to repeat the mistakes of these characters. But it doesn't feel like that. In fact, with characters being tossed on the pile at light speed, there's no time to feel anything. And so when we're left on such a miserable note, you don't really feel moved, you just feel like… eh. The only upside to this is that now that Wolverine is dead, Cyclops can finally be with Jean without any fear of interruption, but even that doesn't last more than 5 seconds as he gets shot in the head immediately after. 
If Magneto drowning everyone wasn't bad enough, the X-Mansion soon finds itself under siege. After losing his family in Magneto's attack, a man called William Stryker joins an anti-mutant supremacist group. Blinded by hatred, Stryker commands a raid on Charles's school, slaughtering students without mercy. The remaining X-Men do what they can to defend the school and actually manage to defeat Stryker's squad, but the damage has been done. Kitty, Bobby, Rogue and Jean are some of the few people left. While grieving, they're approached by the Brotherhood of Mutants, who are like, hey, uh, we're all kinda screwed now, maybe we should band together and form some sort of team? We'll practice what Charles said, we'll put aside our differences and compromise, because the alternative is being murdered in the street. So, what do you say? While before they may have said yes, hell if Charles was there I'm sure he'd get them to welcome the Brotherhood in open arms, but not anymore. While they may have survived Ultimatum, these poor kids haven't escaped the sheer sense of hopelessness that it left behind. Not only do they reject the Brotherhood, they now reject the idea of the X-Men entirely. It's a tainted idea, they now live in a world where Charles' dreams seem impossible. So what's the point? The last image we're left with as the first series ends is a grave, solidifying the X-Men as a thing of the past, a nice little dream which will never become anything more than that. What a Debbie Downer. In the months that follow, mutants are made illegal in the United States, in what is essentially collective punishment for the actions of one guy. Storm and Colossus are put in an internment camp to rot. Kitty is allowed to continue her high school education under the condition that she doesn't use her powers, otherwise she'll be expelled, locked up, and probably waterboarded for good measure. Not only does she receive insane discrimination from her classmates as a result of Magneto's attack, but she also has to share classes with her ex-boyfriend Peter Parker, who, if you're familiar with the Ultimate Spider-Man series, cheated on her, so she's having a real fun time there. Bobby joins Kitty and Peter at high school, pretending to be Peter's cousin, while Rogue and Jean go into hiding. All of them are haunted by their dead friends, they meet conflict every turn, and overall it's not pleasant for anyone. Except Bobby, he's just kinda chillin'. Now it gets to a point where things are looking up. Jean's starting to put her own team together. It's not the X-Men, mind you, she makes that very clear, but they're still setting out to do some good. Kitty and Bobby have settled into their adventures with Peter, Bobby becomes best friends with the Human Torch, it's a nice wee collection of heroes, and the future looks bright for them. And then, well, Spider-Man dies, for starters, leaving everyone heartbroken and messing up what little stability Kitty and Bobby had in their lives. Jean is somewhat discouraged when an attempt to recruit a young mutant ends in tragedy, and if that wasn't enough, Stryker is back, saying, hey, forget the camps, don't lock them up, bring the mutants to me and I'll send them to God instead. During this time, the young mutants really struggle to survive, they're all aimless and exhausted. See, the X-Men were not just a team, they were Charles's team. It was his strength, his coordination, which allowed them to become a whole greater than the sum of their parts. Take away that leadership, take away that wisdom and that big ass mansion, and all of a sudden, it's a lot more difficult to band together. With the ability to become whole having been taken from them, what's left of the X-Men are just parts, lying around, useless on their own. They don't have a controlled environment to fail in. Failure means extinction. With these new stories, the series explores the failure of the older generation in teaching the young. Kitty reflects on Charles' legacy, how yes, he was well-intentioned, but he was also naive. He was a little too wrapped up in his perfect idea of the future, and also falling in love with the students, that he failed to prepare his students to go on without him. Even Stryker's actions, while mainly motivated by his his wife and children, can still be traced back to his own father's failure. No wonder he's so bloodthirsty when he has visions of his dad saying, kill them all son. Unfortunately for the mutants, every move they make seems to be one step forward and two steps back. After Stryker is killed, his consciousness is transferred to like a fleet of a billion sentinels who begin exterminating mutants all across the country. It's a nightmare on the same scale as Ultimatum and there's very little they can do. Unlike Ultimatum however, this dark time is not without hope. Charles's dream may have been naive, but it's not dead, not entirely, and despite all odds, his former students do what they can to keep his philosophy alive. It's here that Kitty steps up. Like Charles, she got pretty lucky with her powers. She can phase through pretty much everything, meaning that as long as she's not a complete idiot, she shouldn't be able to get hurt, like at all. And so, like Charles, her job is to use that privilege to provide for others, to take mutants in, to defend them. Unfortunately for her, she's not a wise, bald man, she's a 16 year old who's completely in over her head, and has to learn on the job out of necessity because if she doesn't step up then someone less worthy of the role will do it anyway. As Kitty becomes the face of the mutant resistance, she's forced to adopt the more destructive methods of someone like Magneto. She carries a gun as a symbol of war, reminding the opposition that no, we're not just going to sit here and take it, we're actually dangerously powerful and we're not afraid to fight for our rights. What sets Kitty apart from Magneto is that she knows when to put the gun down. It's one thing to resist, but she refuses to let that turn into aggression. It's a fight for freedom, not control. 
Her manifesto still emphasises the desire for non-violence for whenever the dust clears. She sets an example for the others, gets them to think about their methods of defending themselves. When someone does kill, it's not like this cool epic moment where they say eat my fucking lasers you bitch. No, they actually acknowledge what happened and ask Kay, hey, should we have done that? There's a proper back and forth about what kind of message they're sending with their actions. Thanks to Kitty's efforts, and others around the country, things do start to turn around. The camps are liberated, the Sentinels are destroyed, mutants unite for a common effort, and for a brief moment, the X-Men are alive again. It's not without a cost, they lose good people, but these sacrifices aren't just overlooked, they aren't just there to serve shock value or add to a kill count. These are treated as real sacrifices, their deaths are acknowledged as meaningful. Now the struggle supposedly ends when Captain America, who is now President of the United States, don't ask, offers the mutants a deal. He empathises with the mutants, also given his time in World War II, he's not exactly the biggest fan of the camps, and so he does genuinely want a good solution to this. Unfortunately he's still tied up in politics. He has to consider all sides, and so the only deal he can give them is a rather shitty compromise. You see, S.H.I.E.L.D. scientists have been able to create a mutant cure, one that strips mutants of their powers. From this point on, mutants will be given the choice of either taking the cure and living a normal life, or they can keep their powers, that's totally fine. They now just have to live on a plot of land in the desert, which will no longer be part of the US, and if they leave this land, they'll be shot, and also the US can take back this land at any time. Fantastic deal. Kitty is not happy with this, like not at all, but at the same time she's in no position to reject this deal. While she's sure as hell not taking the cure, it wouldn't be right to stop the mutants less fortunate than her from taking it. It sucks, but who is she to judge someone who doesn't have awesome phasing powers, whose mutation is actually super debilitating and they're just sick and tired and scared and they don't fucking care about the principles of it and the fact that they're taking the easy option, they just want a normal life now that they have the chance. Imagine if this kid had the cure, and he didn't have to accept his life was over and meet his end in some cave. The majority of the surviving mutants do end up taking the cure, and the small portion of them still wanting to keep their powers and their pride are sent to the desert. As the young mutants attempt to build a new society, they are constantly interrupted by the government. And with this, Kitty accepts a painful truth. This struggle will never end. They'll always have to fight for their existence in some way or another. It's something they've known for a long time, they just didn't want to accept it until now. But while true harmony between humans and mutants may be impossible, that's not exactly a helpful thing to dwell on. It's important for them to remember that their efforts aren't just for nothing, that things can slowly get better over time, as proven by the fact that they're not in a sewer anymore. And so Charles's dream acts as a North Star. They're never going to get to that perfect future completely, but by using that goal to guide them day by day, they'll get closer and closer with each small victory that they make. Of course, one person being the face of an entire group of people means that not everyone in that group will agree with them, and this is where Nomi comes in. Nomi is one of the few mutants left, and she strongly disagrees with Kitty's approach. Just as Kitty puts down the gun, Nomi picks it right back up, instead wanting to go the Magneto route of control, of domination. She says, fuck humanity, we should just have a bloody uprising that ends in us standing over their inferior bodies. We've got our new Charles, and now we've got our new Eric. Now while Nomi represents the exact same ideas as Magneto, it works so much better here than it did with him. Ultimate Magneto's problem was that he had no real redeeming elements because of just how cartoonishly evil he was. There was no argument to be made saying, oh he's got the right intentions, you know, he's just going about it the wrong way. No. This version of Magneto is in it because he just loves killing so much. The guy's a complete psychopath. Also, he wasn't even born until after World War II. He didn't lose his family in the camps, that whole part of his character is completely missing. And so Nomi here is the perfect opportunity to basically fix Ultimate Magneto. Writer Brian Wood takes these same properties, you know, the same cartoonish kill them all attitude, and gives it to a scared teenager. The lack of nuance is actually by design now, because she's just a kid, she doesn't know any better. It's this young age and naivety that makes it so much easier to empathise with her, even though she's messing up Kitty's plans and overall being a pain. Also, she's actually got the proper Magneto origin. She's watched her people get hunted in the street and put into camps and wiped out. She's experienced that firsthand, narrowly escaped, and is now just like, yeah, peace isn't an option. Already, she's more Magneto than Ultimate Magneto ever was. And she's not a cannibal, as far as I'm aware. What's so satisfying is that in the end, Kitty and Nomi are able to do what Charles and Eric couldn't. They're able to accept that they're stronger together and they unite for the greater good. Nomi's not 100% convinced, right? She's not totally happy about joining Kitty, but at least she's been stopped from going down that same path as Eric. She's not going to start the next ultimatum and become the thing she once hated. Because that's the mindset that traps a lot of these characters, right? This eye for an eye attitude, that's how we got in this mess in the first place. Magneto justifies his attack on the world with the deaths of his children. He says the world has to pay for what it did. Stryker does the exact same thing. He justifies his raid on the X-Mansion by saying, hey, you guys have to pay for what happened to my family. 
One of the last pages of Ultimatum is the Thing excusing brutal murder by saying, oh it's fine because you had to pay for what you did. Volume 2 continues this pattern. It shows Colossus getting his revenge on those who tortured him. Now this is completely understandable, but as he does so, Storm comments on the fact that now they are going to have to pay for that. She ends up being exactly right, the response from the Sentinels is what drives Nomi to develop her bloodthirsty ideology in the first place, and all of a sudden we're back to where we started. The cycle of revenge changes nothing but the number of graves you have to dig. Now Kitty initially falls for the same trap. When Jean goes full dictator mode towards the end of volume 2 and tries to kill everyone in the mutant society, I'm going to be totally honest, I forgot why she did that, but the point is Kitty seeks revenge, she says I'm going to make her pay for that. Now as I'm reading this, I'm getting a bit wary. I know they're setting up for a big decision at the end which will define the message of the series and you know what, I've been let down before. As Kitty goes to confront Jean, I'm expecting her to laser Jean's face off at the earliest convenience, but she doesn't. Once Jean no longer poses a threat, Kitty doesn't allow herself to be consumed by revenge. She actually practices what she preaches, puts her personal grudges aside and gives Jean a second chance. Once everyone's kinda chill and there's no mutant factions fighting each other, Kitty and the others finally get a chance to breathe. They have a home, they have hope, they're not so much a collection of people anymore, they're more of a proper team. The X-Men are closer to returning than ever before. Oh my f shit. Just when you think the mutants have been through enough, Galactus from the main universe appears out of nowhere, annihilating New Jersey, thank god, and leaving the rest of the Earth completely defenceless as he begins consuming everything. Now in the Ultimate Universe, Galactus was like this fleet of alien drones that went about destroying planets and stuff. It was the 2000s, I think they were just scared to make it a big purple guy at the time, but upon 616 Galactus' arrival, most of the Ultimate Galactus drones merge with the main Galactus, teaming up to create one big powerful Mega Galactus. This is the final test. Now now that they've managed to protect themselves, now that they've made themselves whole, can they do what the X-Men were made for in the first place and protect others? Can they fight for the world that fears them? While most of the mutants deal with the remaining Galactus drones, Kitty confronts Galactus himself. Due to her phasing powers and the help of some giant man serum, she's the only real person who can fight back, as everyone else will instantly get vaporised if they get close. Despite her being completely terrified, this is Kitty's chance to show the entire world what mutants can really do, what the X-Men truly stand for. Thinking of her friends, her family, all those she's loved and lost, she takes those memories, all that strength from everyone who believes in her and she punches Galactus in the fucking head. The entire planet watches as Kitty Pride fights off the biggest threat they've ever seen, an axe that gets rid of most anti-mutant beliefs formed from Ultimatum. It's Charles's dream brought to life on the highest scale imaginable. Everyone comes together to defeat Galactus, who is fired right into the negative zone. Afterwards, Kitty is allowed to walk freely in the US without being shot. She's offered the Medal of Freedom. It's a little bit silly, everyone's just like, we love you now, but I feel like that's what would happen if someone like saved all of existence. It just goes to show how casual and irrational people's hatred was. In a Q&A with Nick Spencer, the writer of the first half of volume 2, he's asked to sum up his story in one word, to which he responds, belief. And I think that's quite a nice way of putting it. If anything, this story was all about belief. Whether it's leaders learning to believe in their own voice, enemies choosing to believe in the best of one another, or a group of people losing everything yet refusing to lie down and die, sustained only by the belief in a brighter future. It's just nice. It's very Arthur-esque. I can imagine not many people gave the series a chance after Ultimatum, which is a shame because Volume 2 is filled with a lot of amazing stuff. It's thoughtful, it's very human, and will forever be relevant. It's also got Jimmy Hudson, son of Wolverine. Haven't mentioned him until now, but he's pretty cool. I like where he fits in the story and how he sticks by Kitty, even though their attitudes towards violence clash a lot of the time. I wish they could have done more with him afterwards. I think he got sent to 616 or something. Anyways, if you are looking to get into X-Men and you're wanting to buy an X-Men book, don't start with Ultimate X-Men. <laughs> It's uh, yeah, just, just read new X-Men instead. Or go back to the 70s and start with some uncanny X-Men. Alright, that's it. See ya.